Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, I'll pass. As uh, Nirmal mentioned, I'll be discussing um, DevOps and a holistic approach. Starting to think through it more of a, um, a discussion around how you manage your software development uh, processes, as well as how we can look at observability. Um, I know the title is fairly lengthy, but it'll uh, make more sense as we continue. So, so. so during the pandemic, um, you know, one of the things we all started to see a lot of problems with, or maybe we were lucky and didn't, but as a consulting um, company and as a consultant myself, we see a lot of organizations have issues with with continuity problems as more and more companies that were tr traditionally on uh, sites or required uh, most of their development or staff to be in the building. Um, they found that uh, as you needed to progress and you could no longer make it to the office, um, this really became a, a key consideration across the enterprise as, as to, well, DevOps and DevSecOps is maybe something that we need to get to or our manual processes are good enough for now. Um, but throwing to the forefront of months of not being able to collaborate more effectively within the office or to automate tasks made it very difficult for um, development system engineers, QA and, and all of the business staff to really effectively work cohesively within the organization. So really starting to jump forward, um, thinking about how the enterprise can, can start to deal with this. Um, the increased cost of having to do this is one of the key con concepts where DevSecOps really looks to focus on reduction of costs. And as the focus of this starts to become more and more prevalent um, in the industry, as it had already was on the uprise, but since the pandemic has forced the issue, more and more companies are looking for ways to really reduce that footprint. Um, customer satisfaction, of course, is hurt in a number of industries. You know, companies like Amazon, who are already doing most of their uh, delivery and other components, um, and allowing for external uh, de developers to, to work from home, uh, really didn't see as much of an impact, but a lot of organizations um, definitely did. So really thinking about adopting new ways of working and, and of course that business continuity planning is something that we've all started to have to focus very closely on as we continue to move forward. Um, as we still fight through the last of the pandemic, hopefully over soon um, and thinking about the future. So in the application developments uh, landscape, I mean, we've all seen this in one degree or, or another, the, the waterfall of where we all began, depending on where you started your career or how legacy your, your current uh, application system may be. Um, you may be continuing to run on, a, run on a mainframe or do very long drawn out um, uh, deliveries, which may take months, if not years to, to come out with the next version of your software. And as things continue to progress over the years, Agile became and Lean and some of the other components really became a conversation point about how do we improve time to market and improve the ability to, to actively work um, in a more efficient manner that took less time, allowed us to push things out in you know, weeks uh, rather than months or years. And this became a, a good stepping stone a lot of companies are starting to do. And, and is, you know, this also kind of fed well into the cloud as it started to become more and more of a prevalent thing as Amazon and Google and uh, Microsoft, uh, to name you know, the three big players in the market, uh, became more of a, a discussion point. How do we scale and continue to meet customer needs at a more rapid pace became a discussion, but then you know, many organizations have talked about DevOps and, you know, potentially think they know what it means, but the modern era of, of really moving past just a basic agile and into a full DevOps type of um, deployment model, as well as what we'll talk about more of a culture adoption is something that many companies are really starting to, uh, to really strive toward and, and need help understanding. Um, so, you know, really one of the key components of DevOps is that many people think of it as CICD. And while DevOps, you know, the merging of development and operations is certainly utilizes CICD within its tool stack. That's not really what DevOps is all about. Um, you know, one of the key components of what DevOps really is, is it's a merging of, of and changing of the culture within an organization. 
you know, one of the key components many people don't understand is that, you know, while it is Dev and Ops, it's also QA, it's also management, business analysts, um, security team, um, everyone within the organization really needs to buy into this culture. And, you know, the conversation around culture is, well, we have a great culture, don't we? You know, we potentially do a lot of things together. Um, we have we have parties, we, you know, get along well, you know, we do, we make, we're not red every year. So, you know, we're doing fine, aren't we? Well, one of the key things, and I love this quote, it's a great show if you managed to see it at one point, I'm sure you've heard it from multiple sources in the past, but to solve a problem, you really need to understand that you have one. Um, you know, that's really the first step. You have to really have the understanding that something's wrong in the organization. And while that cohesion at some points, the management or executive level may understand that we're not quite meeting our numbers. The resources aren't quite as efficient as we'd want them to be. Um, you know, those these five components or symptoms are, are just a few, but very important in the context where the strategy and culture really don't fit. You know, the we've always done it this way, but we want to move forward. How do we do this? Um, don't always mesh well within an organization. You know. Being manual is one of the biggest component problems where if there's no automation, agile, while it's good to release things quickly, still sees a bottleneck when you're trying to deploy. And QA and development, you know, <laughs> as the common term is throwing things over the wall. So development will finish something, they say this is done, it's functional, they'll throw it over the wall. And QA will test it and find problems um, and then throw it back over the wall and a game of hot potato ensues. And then in the moving down the path, the same thing happens very much in delivery, uh, where essentially everything looks fine, but then when it's deployed, it may not be performance, or you may find additional issues tied to the network, um, or how the application is running. You may have the wrong versions of jar files, uh, to use Java as an example. One of the biggest problems, again, is while they throw everything over the wall, no one seems to communicate together. Uh, the silo or groups don't cohesively act as an organization. They act more as a, I did my job, you do your job type of scenario, which can often cause that culture to, to not really be um, as effective as you want it to be. So thinking through the, the trends in DevOps, you know, as we talked a little bit about the fact that this is jumping to the forefront, even though it was on the uprise, and you know, I'll apologize for the, the bar graph being a couple of years out of date. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a new one, but one thing we, we can say is that in the next um, uh, year, there's $4 billion worth of DevOps in the market worth of opportunity. Um, many organizations or most large organizations are starting to move more toward uh, complete DevOps or at least start to research DevOps as a solution. And CAGR suggests that, you know, 26% rise in that over the next year, um, which, you know, is, is a fairly significant jump over a quarter. And to see over the next you know, five to 10 years, most organizations should, should look to adopt. But as you can see from the bar graph, you know, a majority of teams are at least working or trying to practice that and that continues to rise year on year. But adoption is still somewhat slow. Um, it does cost potentially money and operations to do this in an organization and the lack of knowledge um, is, is one key component that can always be an issue. So. So what is our impediment to change? You know, as I mentioned, different groups. Um, this image is very telling. Um, a lot of organizations tend to break responsibilities into very defined roles and silos. Um, within an organization, as I mentioned, you can have your, your business folks and then development, QA, your operations group, all broken into different groups. And even if you have an agile team, um, where QA and development and maybe even your business analysts or DBAs are, are working together, there's still the disconnect with operations and, and your infrastructure group many times within an organization. So having these separate uh, stages or, or gates within an organization where the project manager and BA do most of the front work and then merge it into the agile team and then back 
um, to operations can often cause those bottlenecks that I mentioned of throwing things over the wall, even with an agile team that can slow things down and, and cause issues. One way a lot of organizations tend to try and solve this problem is to create what they call a DevOps engineering group. Well, you know, in reality, this ends up being just another silo. Um, instead of using the developers and the operations team and merging them, um, having the overlap of responsibilities and understanding of con continuous collaboration, another group is formed that just takes over um, the DevOps engineering, which really in a lot of organizations ends up being no more than a release management group um, that manages deployments. You know, some organizations do understand this and they, rather than it being a DevOps engineering group, they, they start to build this, but this, this is a silo that I see fairly often in many organizations that try to adopt um, DevOps. So that culture for stability rather than growth is one of those things that we, we often have to discuss um, within an organization. You know, as companies continue to build out their silos, it's that conversation point about, well, that's mine, that's yours. You know, how do we, how do we just get this out to the customer as quickly as possible? But, you know, we continue to see a number of problems and those challenges really become, well, silos as we discussed, you know, a project centric mindset. As we think about DevOps, it's crucial to really think beyond that, to really start to think more about enterprise. As we think project mindset, it's the immediate need rather than how do we grow this and how do we really become um, more innovative and forward thinking. And that lack of collaboration, you know, certainly um, does everyone really know what's happening at every stage and how do we uh, potentially improve that by allowing for continuous stakeholder understanding and uh, working together. You know, resistance is often an issue. I mentioned legacy and waterfall at the beginning of this discussion. Well, even in an agile uh, group, many organizations tend to adopt agile in a way that it's a development methodology rather than it's truly away from management all the way down to the customer, how you can adopt and better improve um, the discussion around delivering uh, your products or your projects in a more enterprise friend, friendly way. And often you'll have some people who may have worked in the industry for quite some time doing a specific set of tasks, always having been shoved in a silo, um, not really wanting to change what they do. Um, and again, you know, lack of documentation and retention of that knowledge. While you may have some that are resistant to change, you may have had some, you know, attrition where you continuously see key players leave the organization and, and lose that domain knowledge. And because, you know, the application is very old, a lot of the documentation may not have been continuously updated. And then, you know, again, those internal resources, uh, be they just maybe not having enough for the new technologies or, you know, again, the resistance makes it difficult to ramp up to new, new opportunities and to, to make that positive change. So one of the key components of DevOps is, is really that it comes from open source. You think about the Phoenix Project, which is a book some of you may or may not have read. It's a very good primer um, for really moving forward within a DevOps mindset, but, as you think about the ideologies and the, and the processes that DevOps tries to incorporate, well, open source software does a lot of the very uh, similar things. Um, quick innovation, rapid release, um, really trying to avoid uh, being locked into a very specific subset of features and capabilities. Um, and with open source, very much like DevOps, is you're embracing and understanding what those failures are. Um, how can I move forward and how can I adopt change in a positive way um, to make that our organization or cultural fit really continue to constantly grow and improve, which is something open source is, is um, through its developers and its large community and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of projects. Um, can, we continue to see grow year by year. DevOps is, is certainly mostly um, open source in nature. So as I mentioned, open source and DevOps are kind of go hand in hand. Well, a reality is, and this is just a subset of tooling, but 
if you think through the different components of what DevOps really means, it's, it's everything within the application ecosystem. It's how I deploy it, the security, um, how I store my, um, my code, my uh, deployables, how I test, how I uh, monitor and alert for my complete application. So across this landscape, this is just a subset of a very large number of, of open source tools that are prevalent within the industry that continue to grow. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So as we think about driving that open source, you know, it really becomes that, that partnership, that cohesive um, discussion between all of the different groups in the company. And it revolves very heavily around the people and the, and the culture within the organization. And as I mentioned with Agile, um, you know, DevOps and Agile go very closely together in a lot of the concepts and the processes and methodologies around how you'll adopt DevOps, but it is a top-down solution or bottom up if you choose to look at that way, but everyone in the organization needs to adopt the change. Um, new ways of looking at uh, delivery, new ways of looking at observing and uh, scaling your applications based on you know, more realistic, real-time understanding of how your application is, is going from uh, ideation all the way to delivery and post-production. And of course, I mentioned CICD, while not the core tenet of DevOps, you know, the tools used for automation, you know, should be uh, holistic across the, the entire application landscape. And uh, one of the key things that's missed, and we'll talk in greater detail at the end of this discussion about this, is data and insights. While a lot of companies do monitor, you know, complete understanding and observability of your application is, is one thing that is often left to the end of a DevOps discussion. But those characteristics, again, you know, one of the key components of open source is really empowering uh, people to be innovative and make changes moving forward within the context of, of technology and not just resting on something, well, it works, why, why fix it? Always looking for the best possible solution and how to move forward. And DevOps and open source work very closely in this concept um, and should be implemented in that way. Uh, thinking about you know, the agile methodologies of, of frequent releases and full automation, we mentioned already, but this opens up for a lot of the new technologies and new components that many people are talking about. Um, the methodologies and new architectures around microservices, cloud native and containerization, all need new tooling. Um, throwing things over the wall to the cloud or being able to work in a multi-cloud environment brings up the conversation about um, how do I do this in a way where I'm not just recreating it? How can I do this rapidly across multiple availability zones to use an Amazon term um, or multiple data centers? Um, and then automating things like security um, and of course, quality checking and analyzing that data. Many of you have seen this uh, image previously or something very similar. This really starts to bring together that collaborative discussion where you have development, continuous integration, testing, delivery, and something you know missing from this diagram, but continuous security as well. Um, doing those vulnerability and license checks um, using advanced tooling to understand, especially with the leveraging of open source, you know, are do I have licenses that um, potentially conflict with one another? Um, is my application secure or vulnerable? And how do I manage that? Um, but as you can see, this is a continuous loop of collaborative efforts across multiple groups. So moving past the comfort zone, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of organizations have companies that are resistant to change. Um, really understanding that problem and breaking down those silos is, is one of the key first steps. Understanding that you know, people need to essentially learn and cross train across multiple different types of, of efforts and understand how their current job you know, affects and works with others so that that overlap can be achieved um, for greater efficiency and, and faster um, time to market. And convincing everyone can be difficult, but really helping sell that information is this just isn't a tech thing um, is key. You know, as I mentioned previously, the strategic aspect of this is really looking to scale and understand how we move beyond just this project or I've got 17 projects with various teams 
how do I really think beyond that? How can I start to build something, you know, an actual strategy that meets our customers' needs, you know, utilizing either the technology I have or start to adopt new technologies that will allow me to be more flexible and to scale. Um, that culture of innovation that I mentioned before really in um, allowing and emboldening those developers and, and ops and other folks within your organization to think beyond the proprietary box um, and start to look for open source components, either processes or other ways to do this, and then apply those standards, really implementing new ways of, of working and, and new ways of, of doing uh, development. Um, and of course, automating everything. Um, so, you know, again, embracing this, you know, shared responsibility, you know, getting away from that, uh, that's mine, that's yours, and really starting to adopt that we mentality rather than that me mentality. That's not my problem, um, that's yours, rather than a, this is a problem. How do we fix the problem? How do we move forward? Um, which by adopting that type of mindset, um, and really starting to think more in a, about customer centricity and, and looking to apply for how we can achieve this because a happy customer uh, helps to improve your bottom line. But automation, you know, will, will obviously improve a lot of things, but, you know, reduction in time to reduce issues, enhance testing, ability to gather data and, and time to market as well as developer and, and ops efficiency gains really help to uh, executives really start to buy in by showing them a way to reduce your your total cost of ownership, not just cost of licensing, but making resources more efficient, allowing for their ability to re, uh, produce more is, is certainly a key component of this as well. So what now? Um, you know, we've done this, we've kind of discussed this with all aspects of the organization. You know, they start to do the buy-in, they, they start to understand the changes are necessary. You know, we've started to adopt automation. Well, you know, how do I effectively manage performance at this point? You know, you've said that there'll be benefits. You said that, you know, if we do this, if we work together, if we start to deliver with new technologies that we can, we can really start to see some performance gains. Um, how, how do I really understand that the things are gonna be working for me you know, how do I identify those gaps? You know, maybe I can see some as we start to do this. As if we're, you know, starting to build this culture, you know, how do we understand if we're moving down the right path um, or if we're just finding new ways to re-implement the same problems that we have? But, and how do I visualize that success moving forward? Well, I've done it. The performance isn't great. Well, am I monitoring your application? Well, most people will say yes. You know, they have some tools internally. They may be doing log monitoring. They may be uh, using tools like Splunk or Elk. Um, they may have some, some more advanced tools like uh, AppDynamics or New Relic or some other things for end-to-end -end application monitoring and potentially some tools if they're using the cloud, um, you know, CloudWatch and maybe even um, if they're using older systems, some things in their mainframe or tools like Nagios or Zabbix. But are you sure you're getting everything? Well, within the application maybe, but are you getting all of it? When I talk about all of it, I'm talking about all the components, including the DevOps components, um, the network, the, um, all of the cloud components, your provisioning components, everything that makes up the complete life cycle of your application. Or are you strictly more interested in the production application and how it's running for the customer, which is certainly crucial, but you know, certainly as you think through agile and how you start to track things using tools like app dynamics, it's more about the code. Um, you know, rather than, you know, the teams are collaborating, but you know, you still see issues, your QA and your dev work very closely together, but you're pushing things out, but, those issues may solve a number of application problems, but what about getting it to production in general? So what exactly are you missing in that context? Well, without observability, um, it becomes very difficult to get the whole picture of what you're, you're, you're delivering. Um, again, you may have good insights into your application. You may see all the null pointers that may come up as a mistake or something missed in QA. You may see the occasional uh, problem 
um, because of network traffic. But you know, those things are essentially problematic. Where that actionable data um, doesn't help you with all of your tools. You know, it, you may still be somewhat manual in your process. You may find an issue, and then your developers jump down and they spend uh, you know days potentially digging through logs to find out exactly where the problem is. Um, if you don't have more advanced tools, this is certainly true. Um, if all you use is a Splunk or an Elk, um, you can certainly index and find problems quicker. And depending on the skill level of your, your development or ops staff, you know, they may have a quick, quick fix, but finding exactly where a problem is happening uh, can take time. And typically that reactive scanning, you know, causes it to, uh, to take much longer to solve problems. So, you know, thinking about proactive approaches and what observability actually means. Well, observability is, is really more about the conversation around the data available to track the changes within your system or the issues within your system. Uh, whereas monitoring is the visualization of that. Well, as we think about the trends and observability in the market, you know, tracing certainly is critical, but only 19% um, use a distributed tracing tool, uh, like a Jaeger or other things. And certainly application monitoring or performance monitoring is still a very low number. A monitoring as a whole for critical production level components is, is usually fairly high. But as you can see, the numbers start to degrade as you think through how you know, tracing through the system, instrumentation of, of the infrastructure really starts to, to go down with thinking through tools, as I mentioned, tools like Elk and Nagios. Well, you may have great log monitoring. What about the rest of your tooling? And the DevOps pipeline. So you may have manual, you may have set up some tools like Jenkins or, or GitLab CI or a number of other available uh, tools, Azure DevOps. But are you really looking at the tools and all of the components? Um, most organizations tend to not think in this mindset because it's not customer specific. It's a back end process. Um, CICD tooling, you know, if you think about Jenkins and SonarCube and a number of other tools that exist within this context, many organizations uh, will again think of this as a secondary and your ops and developers may be the only people looking at these uh, components as their issues and may have to go to three or, or maybe as many as six or seven different tools to gather all the information as to what might be breaking at what point in the pipeline. And as I mentioned, it's dev and ops. What about the executive level? Really understanding you know, the technical side of things is, is an impediment to really getting the information necessary to make positive roadmap choices. And you know, again, monitoring and logging um, tools being uh, reactive is, is a key problem where a move toward proactive monitoring is really the, the key for success in a DevOps cultural shift. So near real time or real time tracking, I mean, certainly we all say real time is, is the benefit, but there's always some delay, um, but as close as possible um, and end to end from code check in all the way to deployment um, and delivery um, are key components of DevOps uh, and the monitoring for that should be no different. Um, providing the right metrics and KPIs, not only for the development staff, and for QA to understand things as they push through, but also for executives to be able to make pointed decisions um, is a key component that, that a lot of organizations, you know, while they do this for the application, most executive level folks may see that there's X amount of uptime for a given system. So our systems have been running 99.95%, but they don't really see where are the issues in actually getting something to production. And that's a key component. Um, how do we integrate well and how adaptable is our process, um, which, is, which is very important. So I think all of you may have seen this if you're interested in DevOps, you know, there's a number of different uh, versions of this out there from a number of companies, but it's pretty much the same. As I mentioned, you know, num most of the tooling um, that has been created for DevOps, be it provisioning or a code uh, repository or what have you, uh, is open source in nature and many of the ones that are proprietary utilize open source under the hood. Um, so if you dig through this, you're very likely your organization is using at least you know, one, one of these tools, um, but potentially could use many more. But bringing it all together, really thinking about open source ways to solve this observability problem. Well, you know, there is only one uh, widely 
um, uh, I don't know about widely, but one tool that's essentially open source that has been for several years that really kind of brings together this uh, tooling for DevOps specifically um, to do the visualization of end to end uh, monitoring. It's called Hygia. Um, Hygia was originally created by Capital One. I don't work for Capital One, so this isn't a sales pitch, but it is a very uh, um, solid, extendable tool. It gives strategic insights uh, that you know, most other tools, uh, you can get some and proprietary tooling and you can get some flexibility. Um, however, Hygieia written in Java and, and fully extendable allows you to continuously build on the, what's called collectors or in other terms, if you were to use very similar to Elks, Beats or agents from other components to really pull in the data from all of the appropriate tooling to get a single pane of glass type of, of approach. And this is an example workflow of, of how your DevOps cycle might work um, from the development team all the way to, to post-production. Um, where Hygieia, as you can see in the center, actually has collectors across the entire ecosystem. Um, and the ones that don't exist can be created fairly rapidly um, to pull that data into a Hygieia data store and make that um, visible through Hygieia's uh, dashboards. And those dashboards exist in, in two ways. As you can see, the development dashboard is, is really component level. It talks about component lifecycle progression and you'll forgive the imagery because I'm not the best at animations, but as you think about how you might adopt JIRA into your single pane of glass, you start to migrate um, these tools and start to integrate them with and start to build through these variant widgets components that will show you all the information that you need. And again, this is fully customizable. So I can pick and choose the tools that best fit my organization and what I might be adopting and see all the information uh, that's relevant to me, be it code quality, how are the builds progressing around among different tools? How are my sprints uh, through Jira or other tools um, uh, currently working? You know, how many issues are problems and then what's my code repo look like? How many issues have been uh, done within the check-ins, pull requests accepted and so on and so forth. But essentially you can pull in any number of tools, performance tooling um, and other components like white source or black duck or things to that perspective might be used for the security analysis that you would see here. So this development dashboard really helps developers and ops people work through the problems and potential um, real-time understanding to proactively see where problems continue to exist. Um, maybe certain sprint teams or certain parts of the code repo are more problematic than others or certain builds to certain um, uh, Kubernetes clusters, for example, may be failing. And you know, so they can proactively review. And then one of the things I mentioned previously is also looking at things from an executive perspective. Well, executives also like to see what's happening and beyond the uptime of a server, understanding how they're resources are working. What are the risks potentially for different variant projects um, across the enterprise? Or you can pull together an executive dashboard um, that manages things like um, future investment insight. Um, am I going to need more uh, resources or servers? Uh, how many security violations do I continuously uh, see? Leveraging a number of, of tools throughout the industry as you can see at the top and the bottom of this, this dashboard. So it's very flexible. Um, and while it does leverage open source, uh, it also has the power where it being an open source tool also allows you to pull in um, tooling that is not open source. As you can see tools like Excel Deploy, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Black Duck and White Source, while our tools for actually scanning um, open source tools are not open source themselves. So you can leverage any number of tools, be they open source or proprietary to pull into a dashboard. But the key is actually providing observability. And while Hygieia is one obvious uh, open source possibility, there are obviously other tools that offer observability. But you know that executive buy-in I mentioned earlier really becomes more relevant when they can really understand and be given the key KPIs and metrics necessary to make the proper decisions. And by providing that observability across DevOps, it gives you insight that you previously would not have had into you know, resource and process efficiencies. Um, 
you know, understanding those bottlenecks and really where the, the governance capabilities within your organization are, are really a key component. And being able to see that agility, starting to really think through uh, the scale of how your, your roadmap currently exists will help you better plan as an organization moving forward. Um, again, a unified view is always a key consideration. Uh, many organizations have the problem where their application network and other monitoring tools are, are multiple tools without a single pane of glass. Providing that single pane is, is a key for organizations to very quickly make decisions as well. And then again, you know, pro avoiding those production issues by really understanding early on in the process and early on in your deployment capabilities throughout the pipeline will really help you to get things to the customer faster and allow you to resolve problems more quickly. So the question is, is you've heard a lot of things about DevOps, a DevOps culture, you know, how you can improve um, by breaking down and changing some of the ways of working and, and through observability. Are you ready to start making a change? Well, that's, that's a good question. So, you know, hopefully some of us have given you some insight. Um, that concludes this. I believe we had some time left. Uh, I do have one question in here. I guess I can answer verbally. In what ways can engineers that don't have much influence in their org help make the movement towards developing a DevOps culture? That's actually an excellent question. Um, and this kind of goes back to how well does your organization empower um, the people within um, your organization to make positive change? Um, you know, I find that in most organizations, engineers you know, may not have direct power. The management typically makes strategic decisions. However, most management staff, if you can quantify um, what the change provides to the organization, and show how there are gaps missing and how there are continued efficiencies. This is the key way to really help to under, the organization understand the need for change. And not our, all organizations, unfortunately, are ready um, to make a DevOps culture change. Um, it is something that many organizations, again, as I mentioned earlier, have to realize there's a problem to do. But engineers typically are the first people to innovate within an organization. Um, you know, engineers tend to look uh, for new ways to solve problems. Um, having been a developer for over 20 years, I can tell you one of the things that consistently always caused me heartache was we kept running into problems because you know, I would develop something and then I'd have to wait months um, for it to round robin through QA or it take over 10 hours to deploy to, to a given environment because of very manual processes. Well, that innovative mindset of the developer or ops um, people to jump in and find those ways to test out tools and show the, the speed improvements or capabilities, not only of the tools, but of some of the process improvements. So waterfall, for example, versus agile, um, all the way to a DevOps culture change, assessing and really understanding at what phase you are is the first step. Um, and then being able to work with management to really show that um, that change is possible. And, and it's incremental. No, organ no organization, be it a move to Agile or a full DevOps, um, can just jump in and expect complete change um, immediately. It, it takes time, it takes education and training. Um, but it is something that, you know, certainly an engineer um, can help uh, provide positive uh, quantitative uh, numbers to show how some of these changes really should be considered. Oh. All right, thank you for answering that question, Eric. Um, let's see, is there, uh, does anyone else? Oh, we got another question, perfect. Um, any reading materials you could recommend about quantifying these potential improvements? Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a number of uh, good websites out there. Um, I don't have the, I have them bookmarked on my other computer. Unfortunately, I had to give this uh, from my, my uh, personal laptop because of some issues with my work one. But I, I certainly, um, I believe if you would like to email me, um, if you look at the bottom of the presentation, there is uh, my email. Uh, please feel free to email me if you'd like some of that information and I'll absolutely provide some links. Um, and some material that you can uh, you can take a look at. Uh, 
Um, as far as sites around learning about uh, DevOps tools um, and online training, uh, free or premium, well, I'm I'm a big fan of free. Um, being, I lead the open source uh, services group or practice uh, consultants within uh, my organization, and we are very much about free and open source tooling. Um, but it really depends uh, in what aspect you mean. Uh, DevOps tools is a very broad discussion point. Um, certainly Hygieia can be found uh, immediately by going to GitHub um, and doing a search on Hygieia. Um, but this is a broader topic. Um, you know, Kubernetes, Docker, um, Terraform, Jenkins, um, and the, the list continues to grow of, of DevOps tools um, exists. So, um, if your organization uses tools like Udemy, um, which is a paid tool, um, that's one potentially pl potential place uh, you could look. They have some very good uh, some very good classes. But if not, you know, YouTube is is a treasure trove of things. Again, Ben, if you'd like to send me an email, I'd be more than happy to uh, to have a side conversation on this as well because that's uh, that's a very broad discussion um, we could we could have. And that goes for the rest of the attendees as well. I'll be more than happy to have some discussions on that. 